uh, police come through the door, caught me red-handed. Um, basically, I it was my flat, you know, and it sort of basically um, I had to take the rap, you know, and it, 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 I, I'm not hiding behind it. You know, we we did have a, a large amount of drugs there for, for me and the lads were there, and um, it's something that, you know, I, I can look back now 10 years later and, and think, you know, what the hell went on? But unfortunately, I got sent. I had a custodian sentence for two years. Experience Real Podcast. Right, thanks for coming in, Dan. No worries. Good Appreciate to be you, here. mate. It's, um, to be fair, it was, uh, it's a privilege to be uh, asked to come on the Experience Real because uh, I have to see Andy Powell. He was chopsing about me. So uh, <laughs> I thought I'd better come in and uh, give you my side of the story about how the fight went and um, just some of the stuff that building up to it, all that with Andy and stuff. And um, just everything, probably everyone's wondering who the fuck I am, basically, <laughs> to start. Like, who's this Danny Dig and all this? But um, people in Midwells probably know who I am through rugby, work, and um, just stuff that I've done through boxing promotions and um, stuff I've done for the help for the, to help the homeless and stuff and stuff like that, really. So. Yeah, maybe it'd be good to get into that, have a, have a talk about it. So, like, with the boxing, well, I had Andy on and he talked about it and he talked about fighting you, so... Uh, you you done a promotion before that, though, didn't you? Did you do a fight before that? Yeah, we done we done two events before that. We done three all together. Um, basically, it stemmed from I think probably about going on almost two years ago. Now. Yeah, it was two years ago. Cause it come up on my Facebook time up. Um, basically, I, it was Tyson Fury's comeback fight. Uh, I watched it and I thought, if that's the best Britain's got to offer in a boxing world, then it's it's you know it's a poor show. And I put typical me put on Facebook before I thought about it. Just said that, I, and a load of people called me out. When you get in the <laughs> ring, when you do this, when you that, and I thought to myself, I still hung over. It was it was on Sunday morning. I thought, do you know what? When I when I can try it, like so. Um, I went up that week to the pavilion in Landod. Um, they're sort of like cherry. They, they run themselves like sort of charity. Massive building, absolute hell of a place to hold. It's Grand Pavilion. It can hold like seven hundred people. And it was I, as soon as I walked in, I thought, fucking you know, hell, if we filled this, this would be unbelievable. And I went and saw the bloke there, Jason, and I was like. Have you ever had a boxing event here? And he said, the last one that was here was in a war. First World War in the f- uh, 1940 oh, something. And uh, he said they had 1,100 people in here. And obviously, because they're all standing in and And it was all the Marines and the Army fighting against each other. And I go, you know, let's, let's do it. I said, are you happy to do it? If I saw all the insurances out and get the fighters, all you've got to do is supply the bar and the venue. I'll sort everything out. And he said, if you could do that, good. So uh, we had a good four months leading up to the first event. Um, I couldn't do it all on my own because obviously I was working at a time, playing rugby at a time. And... Um, so I managed, I was very lucky enough to get in contact with uh, an old schoolmate of mine, a girl I grew up with, Sammy Cheeser. She's uh, she's contracted to the BKB. She's um, a cut woman. Ah, oh, right, yeah. Yeah, um, she was like my partner in all, th- all three of them. She was a, she was like sort of basically just the backbone of it, really. But they hadn't, because I was always, obviously, believe it or not, face of, face of promotions, but um, she was just, the work she did was unbelievable by bringing like, the away fighters, sorting the refs out, sorting the rings out. So I knew nothing about it. Like typical me jumping in head first <laughs> thinking, you know, this would be I right. I can fucking do this. Like, yeah, 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 I can do it. But then come to it and think, fucking hell, actually, I've got to do this. How the hell am I going to do it? And um, so Sammy came on board. She come and met me one day and we sat down and said, how do you feel about it? Because obviously she was contracted to BKB then. So she couldn't sort of go off and do her own events because she was obviously contracted. But um, I said, what if we do it for charity? So um, she said, you will do it for charity. And um it's quite a weird story, quite a touching one as well, because obviously Sam, I knew who's had breast cancer before as well. Um, she's fought through it, and she, you know she's yeah. she's strong as ever now. So it meant a lot to her as well. And for me at the time, uh, I was working for a, working for a bloke called PJ Martin, who sadly passed away a couple of months ago. Um, worked for him for like fifty, well, about ten years on and off over the years, and such an inspirational bloke to me. Um, he he had bowel cancer at the time as well, yeah. and he, so I thought, you know what, it's to see someone that you look up to. And it means so much to you, and he's such a you know hard man, and see the cancer just attack him how it did, and and bring him down. It, it just makes you realise sometimes you know like they say cancer's just got no victims, it just chooses them, doesn't it? And um, yeah, no one's invincible like that. So they. we we wanted to do an event, uh, brought in obviously based you know that was something that meant a lot to us, and um, so we were lucky enough. I think after the first event, I was gonna donate. We you know we've done an amazing first event. We had ten local, no eleven local fighters. Sam. Managed to source a gym from up north, Nottingham Way. Um, and basically, they sort of trained. They started training um, at Nick's gym. Yeah. Um, under Martin Thomas. I don't know if you've probably seen them boys. They've been involved in... Uh, I've seen, like, the Nick's gym and stuff tagged it, yeah. when you were doing it. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. So, it. to be fair, I got on with them in the first event. Um, tidy enough. But, like, obviously, 
gym lads being gym lads. They think they can do what they want, can they? And those are like, hang on a minute, it's my fucking promotion. Uh, you got it's a bit of conflict there, was yeah, it? There was a little bit in the second one, yeah. So I thought, do you know what? We, we sort of parted companies a little bit. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to obviously come in and slag Nick off, even though I called him out New Zealand for. I did a, see that as for, well, yeah. For a fight in 2020, in 21, but um, I still haven't an answer. Funny enough, um, I don't know whether he's uh, he's he's got a lot on uh, on go at the moment, and he's um, obviously he went under the um, he opened up to to his gym and doing Corona, and he obviously got. Court doing that. Oh, did he? I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. He, he was on the he was on the um, Wales Online. I read it on there. See, and you don't know what's true with Wales Online. Cause they sometimes. Oh, mate, the head like you can't just read the headline either. No, it's like no. conflicting with what's yeah. in there. Like, so I, I got chatting a lot of my mates go to the gym and stuff like that, and um, they just said, you know, we opened up. A lot of people. I've never been a massive gym man. I ain't got. I just haven't got it in me. I, I you know, if, if my heart's not in it, I won't bother doing it. And um, then boys went to the gym, and it helped some of you know with event health. Mental illnesses, yeah, yeah mental, totally agree. You know, you know, and all that. So I, I take my hat out to him for that. If he's gonna help him with that, then fair play. If yeah. you can look at the supermarkets now and look at how packed they are and how much you walk around, you Ooh. the first thing you do in a supermarket, you pick it up, you look at it. I don't want to have the next one, and then exactly, and then twenty, thirty people are touching that. Do you know what I mean? So the supermarkets, I know they're essential because of food, but some things I just think. That you know, I, I was going to say that we're not talking about COVID, but we're fucking here straight away. Then you just end up on it. It's yeah, just you do, too, yeah. It's so, um, such a big part of everyone's life at the minute, isn't it? It is, yeah. But regardless, obviously, moving on from, like, all that, I just think the the, the fights that were that we did, that were local lads, they all trained at Nick's gym, and the Martin Thomas and Nick's gym, and um, fair play to them. They all stood up, and none, none of them boxers. I think there was one, Dave Jones, who was the main event, who was, who was an absolute cracking little fighter. He is. Um, his Dave, I've known him for a long time. He's had about, I think it's about 30 odd amateur fights. Yeah. Oh, okay. He was the main event. And um, there was a, a, a quite a sad story from that as well. The day before he he was due to fight and be the main event, look, um, his flatmate passed away in a car crash. Never. Uh, I remember coming down in the morning of the event, uh, come to my house and um, it's in all way and I thought something was up. What's the matter? Mate? Everything all right? Everything all right? And, thought he'd injured himself like and he comes to the door and you know I give David a bit of cut because he was crying and he's upset and it's what's the matter mate and he said oh my flatmate's passed away and I was just like fuck yeah. do you know what I mean um, I didn't know what to do yeah. but the thing I said to him what I just stood there and I said mate what what would he want you to do what would now nah, would he want you to do you know you can obviously mourn his death and stuff like that but what would he want to do and he said he'd want me to go out there and fight and I said fair play to you mate fucking do it then go out there and own that show that show's yours you know and with Dave he's been like sort of a lad in town that everyone knew his box but no one's ever watched him because there's always been there's been no events locally so we went out and done it he fought against um, a lad from up Shrewsbury Way who's, who's had a lot of amateur semi-pro fights as well he actually, he's actually fought Amir Khan really yeah stadium, that's and, um, mad, isn't it? it is and <laughs> this is the worst thing as well the touching story it was such the first event had so many things obviously with Sammy with cancer battling cancer Dave losing his um, Dave losing his uh, flatmate yeah, and yeah. obviously the, it, it, the lad that he fought had lost his sister to cancer. Um, I think she was three or four years of age, t- um, about four or five months before as well. So there a lot was a of lo- emotions, a lot going of emotion. In. Yeah, yeah. And um, for me personally, to sort of be like the to run it all and and uh, how it went off, um, and obviously the reputation I used to have in my town for a bit, you know being a bit of an asshole and stuff <laughs> to pull it all off, to see people there, you know, everyone dressed up, doing all their smart suits and stuff like that, and um, at the end of it, come up the end of the night, everyone had a good night. You know, it, we managed to raise the first event. Uh, we I think when everything was all sort of settled, and we made just under f- just over four thousand pound. Yeah, that's a good amount of money, isn't it? Yeah, it was. For, and that was going to go to. Um, I was just going to give it to cancer research, but um, luckily, one of my mates, Sean Acton, she's a she's a um, dropping names in and out. So this is going to be the this the little f- <laughs> f- uh, famous moment. Um, uh, big thanks to everyone in it. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. And basically, she said, "Dig, go up to um, get up to Bracken Trust, like go and see them, and you'll just see the amazing work they do." Like, in it. and uh, after going up there. And actually, Bracken Trust, they're like, they're such an amazing charity because they're, they're all volunteers, some of them full-time, do you know what I mean? They're like sort of retired people. Mm. They're like an aftercare for cancer patients and not, not just the patients, the families as well. So they sort of get everyone in and it's such a nice setting up there and um, the work they do is unbelievable. So I went up there and I thought, do you know what, they can have it. Because like, cancer research, sometimes you, you don't even know where it's going. You, 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 such a big name, such a big organisation. There's so yeah. many people who are taking bonuses and stuff. But, well, I'm not yeah. saying, I don't know if they are, but no. you always hear the rumours, don't you, of big charities, the money just gets lost. Like, Yeah, there's, well, to be honest, there's rumours, there's a lot of rumours circling, circulating about me, about apparently it was me, I was taking money from the charity and I thought, hang on a minute, like, I I can have, you know, single down and said that I took no money from it, but the people, 
that are not even willing to get off their ass and put an event on or do anything are the people, the same people that are judging you. It's, it's just, a jealousy thing, it is, mate. They're like looking at you. It's, it's pointing out like an insecurity in them. Like they'd like to yeah. do it. Yeah. They're seeing you're doing it. It's like putting the mirror on them. Why aren't I doing it? Do yeah. you know what I mean? And they're just getting jealous. Like I didn't even think in my wildest dreams that I'd become like all of a sudden it coming to like big dig promotions. Like I made that name up and all of a sudden it, I started selling it on Facebook, like doing raffles, like and share this post. And it was obviously the, the post that we had made for the event. And then it was just spreading it. And all of a sudden, you know, we had a boxing event and I, th- I think it was the second highest in 10 years, second highest like amateur attendance in 10 years in the whole of Brit- Welsh boxing. Like it, we really? Had, yeah. But it was, I think at the first event it was like 680 people there. So like it was absolutely buzzing. We had a real good night out after, woke up the next day, absolute buzzing. But I did feel a little bit of emptiness a little bit in myself. Um, I put a lot of pressure on myself to um, do the event and uh, get it to where it needed to be. And then there was, it's weird, there was a little bit of emptiness inside after it. it like, That's after it, every high though, isn't yeah, it? Like it is, a yeah. low and you get, you feel like weird, don't you? It's like, yeah. Oh, yeah. And also like you expect it to be this thing that's going to fulfill you, don't it? But sometimes like, like, yeah. you need like yeah. ongoing goals, isn't it? Yeah. And then so that just sort of basically, I thought, fuck it, let's do it. Let's do another one. Let's do another one. What, what can we do? And um, so there's this little bit of um, arguing between me and Nick's gym and Martin Thompson, the coaches, they were like, oh, you, some of them, oh, they, oh, we're not having our fighters. They call them their fighters now. Well, to be honest, I, I put them all in your gym to start with, apart bar two or three of them. So they went on anyway to um, do the, they were on about doing their own event they were. So uh, I, I, I knew that they were going to struggle to do it because I knew what it took to, to sell it. It took fucking hours and hours. And I was working like a full-time job at, at then. Do you know what I mean? Out on the groundworks, um, getting home. And the minute I got home from like six o'clock till 10 o'clock at night, ringing people, you know, and... We managed to get like the second event. Then we managed to get Alex Reed to come yeah. to the sec- to the second event. Uh, he's a good mate of mine now. Where uh, we speak quite a bit to. Honestly, messaged me quite every now and again. He's asking me oh, when we doing next. When we do next. That's pretty cool, isn't it? It's good. Yeah. It's, um, he's a very, very weird, strange but lovely man. Like do you know, what I mean? he's <laughs> he's just there's only one of him. Yeah, do you know what yeah. I mean? And um, I met him the first time I met him, and uh, he was <laughs> I met him in the Metropole and uh, put him up in a hotel and all that, and said, look, there's, you go, there's your bar, have this. We'll cover the costs and all that, you know, celebrities, blah, blah, blah. And he said, the first thing he said to me is, he goes, um, shall I dress up as a female tonight? <laughs> I was like, fucking what? No, you're not dressed up as a female, Alex. I said, you come here to a boxing event. And to be honest, there's probably a lot of women that wanted to see him as yeah, well. Yeah. He's a bit of a sex icon with Jordan and all that and stuff like that. And I did ask him about the stuff with Jordan and all that because he probably gets it a thousand times, doesn't he? You know, and um, he d- he did talk a little bit about stuff I don't I don't really want to go into like some sort of confidential yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. But um, you know, he's a top bloke. He had a, he enjoyed his night. Well, he, I think he enjoyed his night. You know, to coming down and he did say to me after me and Sam that he wanted. I think he felt the buzz of it of what we were doing in these events. He wanted to be part of it because he said, you know, I, I, we can come in as a, I, he wanted to come in as a bit of a business partner, a partner, and sort of venture away from the charity thing, and sort of do it as a as a, like a proper promotion. Yeah, yeah, and um. So that's when after like the, you know, we went into the the third event and I, um, I didn't bother getting the celebrities this time because they just it it just drains money out of the funds like you know and um, people don't realize like they may be charity events but they they got to run, understand that what the money's left from running the event that's what goes to the charity it's not just all the money goes to charity so like you've got the boxers the way boxers you've got <laughs> you've got the alcohol that I put on the tables the food that you put on the tables the VIPs the venue. The referee, the insurance, the ring, and it just all of a sudden you're looking at eleven grand. Yeah, and, and you're, you're thinking, "How the fuck am I going to get this?" So you've got to sell it. And I was literally just—it was constant every night. I'd get home and I'd be messaging people, and, and I was lucky enough through Facebook that I'd get—you'd have such a wide variety of lads like Brecon Rugby Club come up to the, to, you know, to the event, and they they brought a bus load up to watch yeah. it all and. Um, you get like your lads that I've worked with, you know, farmers, a big old table. It was just a hell of a good. I think there was about twenty of us who come to watch Scott Lewis fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he's a good old boy. I probably almost expected Scott to pop in you know, <laughs> soon. He did mess. He's been on the wind up, and he. Oh, he messaged me saying, uh, "When you go down to do the experience thing," and I said, "Oh, I'm going to get down there." And he, he's always oh, welcome to the Scotty Lewis show. You're going to get punked. He said, "I'm almost <laughs> expecting the pop out here now." Probably with a load of bloody God knows what thrown at me. I'm going to. Luckily, we moved the date, so he's clueless at the minute. Good, yeah, good, good <laughs> enough. Stay where you are, Scott boy. But no, I take my hat off to Scott. Um, I met him through playing rugby down here in Krakow. Um, we'll get, hopefully get onto a bit about that now in a minute with uh, with them boys. But um, cracking bloke, sort of sort of lad I want to spend time with. Do you know what I mean? He's a he's a bit cutthroat, but 
you so know, it's how it is, isn't it? Yeah, so it's how it is. But you know, we can stand with people like that, and that's what I love. I don't. He didn't beat around the bush about nothing. And when I messaged him, he was having an hour and a little bit to start with, only due to the fact that he was involved with a gym. Like, and that that was a little bit of issue I had as well with finding fighters these promotions. Some of them were in gyms, and some of them were doing like K one or kickboxing and stuff like that. So they they had like they were training, you know, two or three times a week with their with with their coaches and. I hope to think that some of their coaches don't think I've been disrespectful by like sort of getting them on the show. But like I was just trying to say, what what better is there as a fighter to fight, you know, in your home crowd in front of seven eight hundred people, which wouldn't happen at those other events because they wouldn't yeah. they, they'd be lucky to get sixty seventy people there. And it's not saying it's like a, a big thing that I was doing, but it was just not just the fighting. We sold we sold the whole night. Do you know what I mean? We had the tables, the VOTs, the champagne, the food, the ring girls, do you know, and it was just a big promotion altogether and then you get the night out after and it, it was just an amazing, amazing experience. Like, you know, I, I loved every minute of it. And I, I agree, mate. It was a great night and then it was quite, it's quite mad because I've been to a couple of like amateur boxing events. Yeah. Like being in Watchmates and stuff and you, you see it's just not the promote, like you said, the promotion is not there. Yeah. It's kind of the people's friends and family are going. That's it. And yeah. that's it. But it's like quite direct. There's not like diverse group of people going. Because no. like you said, it's not entertainment as such. It's more no. like you're making your way up through the ranks. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Whereas mine was nothing to do with that. We weren't affiliated with no governing body or nothing. That's probably why it's quite easy to get the promotion. Really. And the insurance, I thought I'd have trouble getting insurance, but that sells straight through because it was, is it? We, 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 we weren't governed by anyone. We, we, we're not, we, we weren't, at, we weren't like an app governed with an amateur club or anything like that it was just a just a, just basically white collar boxing really like yeah so, and to be fair that some of the performances like scott done done class he trained yeah. i know he trained hard he's got some good boys training him and i see some of his followers snapchats now they're boring as hell because he's uh most of them are about food but i can't t- say too much about that because mine are just as bad at the moment but um <laughs> he's um he when when i when i approached scott and uh, i when he said he was he, he was definitely up for it i knew that he'd bring 30 or 40 lads with him and I know he sell tickets and straight away bang he'd selling tickets and straight away oh they got two VIP tables bang and it took when you had someone like that on side who was not only a fighter but he was helping me out he was helping me sell the show as well that's what so you what need I mean? isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it took so much pressure off me to worry about uh, like other stuff like insurances or uh, the away fighters that Sammy she helped sort all them out but they, you don't know who's coming down they, they call you know whether the, some of them they call them like journeymen where they're just coming down for a bit of cash. You know the, the way fighters they did get they all got paid. Do you know what I mean? But you don't know you didn't know them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So there was that aspect of a little bit like what are the local boys getting involved in who they are. But like to be fair, Sam knew the gyms very well. She's been around you know the people that she that those those clubs that were invited down to fight against us. So we knew that the fights were going to be very fair. And I think the way that we'd done it, we made sure that obviously they were all within a couple of pounds of each other weight-wise and to make sure fight-wise they were, you know, obviously some of them were going in the ring for the first time then some of them had two fights. So like that's, we had to try and get it as fair as, yeah. uh, you know, as we Cause could. Because it, it is a scary concept with this white collar boxing that someone who yeah. wasn't quite good enough to be a pro goes in against someone yeah. who's never boxed yeah. before. And exactly, it's, yeah. And I think that goes back to the bit where the third event when uh, when I fought Andy, I at, when I first contacted him to start with, um, I rang him up. I said, "Look, Andy, I got to do something bigger for the next show. I got to do, I got to get it out there." Everyone's probably a little bit bored of like the local lads fighting now. How can we do it bigger? I said, "Do you want to get involved?" Like, and he said, "What do you mean? Come up on, oh, come up on a piss, is it, Diggs? No, no, Andy, <laughs> no, no, no one doesn't. How about? Do you want to get in the ring? Um, straight away, yeah, no problem. For charity, we'll do it. Happy days." So, yeah, I played a powerly. I thought about it, but then I sat back and I thought, what if he gets in the ring with someone who knows what they're doing? And like Andy, don't know, he's a big, strong bloke, you know, he's 20, 19 stone, whatever he is. But if he gets in the ring with someone that's 18, 19 stone, they've, done, they've had three fights and they know what they're doing, he's going to get fucking hurt. Like, so regardless of how, you know, big and strong he is. So I thought to myself, I went off, off the boil of basically getting him someone that knew what they're doing. And I, I it just come to my head then and I knew 100% that everyone wants to see me get dropped. <laughs> everyone in Midwells would love to see me get knocked out. And I thought, do you know what? I'll fucking, I'll, I'll put my head in and we'll have a go at it. Like, I'm not a boxer far from it. Like, but, um, I, you know, I just had, had the balls to ring him up and say, look, mate, do you fancy fighting me? And um, he was like, are you sure? Like, and I said, well, yeah, let's, let's get involved. Let's do it. At least we and you, we know each other. You're not going to get in the ring with someone that's like, do you know what I mean? Because at, at one time we were both going to fight in it. Um, I was going to fight against a boxer. Luckily, you know, after look, watching a fight, fucking thank God I didn't. Like, you know what I mean? but, um, but like, yeah, he was such a top bloke. He was speaking to me all the way up, and um, 
I was on Facebook a little bit taunting him, you know, fucking get out the pub, Paula, and fucking send yeah, him all these... Um, build it up, innit? Try and build it all up, but everyone bought into it. And um, it was such an amazing event. And obviously the likes of, you know, Wales Online covering it as well. It was absolute, you know, they, to get interviews, to watch on, to watch after it, you know, Wales Online, uh, and you're, you're watching your interview two or three days later after the fight, and you're seeing this having like 10,000 views, and you just think, fucking you know, hell. Yeah, it's mad. This isn't has it? come from a fucking pissed up fucking Facebook status about Tyson Fury, and all, <laughs> and all of a sudden I want. Oh, you know it what escalates. I mean? so yeah, it did. Yeah, and um, I can't thank Andy enough. He's more than keen to jump in the ring again. He said when it's the right time. Luckily, you know, I heard, I see on Twitter that he called out James Haskell at one point. I don't know if that'd be a good idea. No. He's, he's been training Emma. He's, is he signed for Bellator though? Anyway, isn't he? It, yeah, yeah. But I, I think, think he'd struggle to get a fight contractually. Well, probably. he struggled to be. He struggled to beat an overweight. Digger driver from bloody mid <laughs> so he, he's definitely not going to beat James Askell. So um, good luck to him, you know, in, in his future. If he, I'd more than happy put it, you know put him in the ring against someone. Hopefully, it'd be nice to get him in the ring against another rugby legend like yeah. perhaps go down that way. But um, sort of my next event, if we ever get to do one after COVID and stuff like that, I'm going to be pushing to do it like MMA, like the like cage fighting sort of thing because it's a bit more. I'll be honest with you, I personally, this is just my personal opinion. I definitely think. Boxing is a lot more technique than MMA. Like with MMA, you can grapple, you can do everything. You could be boxing. You've just got to be good at one thing. Yeah, and it's so technique. Like and like I shown like the first round, me and him and the ad, it was just fucking barn dance scrap, wasn't it? We were swinging. <laughs> he um he didn't hit me much to be honest. He uh, he he uh, he managed to push me over in the first round. He didn't hit me. He didn't catch me in the head once. I don't think, but um. It took a lot out of me because I give him everything I could try and give him in the first round. Cardio race. as well, isn't it? Oh, I was fucking blown out my I, ass. I'll be honest, though. I thought you did better than I thought you were going to do. I think everyone did. Because, like I said to Andy when he was in here, it was quite close it up was, until yeah. the point where it stopped. Yeah. And boxing ability-wise, you probably look more conventional than he did actually boxing. Yeah, well, he did He did, He did. did fucking cover up for fucking... For, for <laughs> minute, he didn't know where he was at one point. He was looking around. And, but, um, yeah, it's... Boxing is, I take my after anyone because it doesn't matter how good you think you are until you, when you get in that ring, all that training goes out the fucking window. Not that I've done a lot, but you just get this channel vision and it's quite a scary thing because yeah. it's just, you don't, you're not even looking at the crowd, nothing. And you're just concentrating, is this 19 stone rugby fucking player going to knock my head off or not? That, and <laughs> and you just, that was in my head the whole time. Like yeah. it's that bit of a fear thing. And um, he, we had a good fight and um, he, he managed to get, he got the victory through basically, he didn't, he didn't hurt me. I just couldn't breathe. I was cro- I was literally cross-eyed. I was that. I, I literally couldn't. It's the worst. I, you know, I've, I've rode bikes. I've, I, I've played rugby, football, done a, as much sports as I can. But that was, I'd never been so exhausted in my whole life. Yeah, it and, just takes it out of you, oh, it? beyond. And I, I thought to myself, do I take a knee and not come out? Which is a bit of a pussy's way, which it was. But he probably would have knocked me out. He probably would have caught me with one of those big old fucking shovel hands. Like, yeah, and, he, and then, I, and then it, I would have never lived it down then, would I? So at <laughs> least I went in, done, it, done him in the first round, and then I started the second round, I caught him with a massive right hand, and I thought that was a good night for him. Yeah. But he just stood there and hit it up like Pac-Man. He's used like, to big blows, I expect, seeing him, yeah, like, with the is. rugby, at the level he was playing, I expect you getting hit pretty hard, like, oh, consistently, aren't you? Well, it's, he's been on the Lions tour, he's done everything you could do with rugby, like Andy, and, He's such a great bloke because I've met a lot of rugby internationals, just some of them on nights out or some of them just at conventions and stuff like that that I was lucky enough to have been to. And um, they're just plant pots, most of them. They're fucking just in the corner. You, you wouldn't even, they, they've got no personality. Yeah. Where Pauli is just, he's just like a lad and he's one of the boys and you could have a great crack with him. And um, he's, I, I just love the bloke. Without licking his ass too much. But if he does want to have another pop at it in the future... Um, you know, it this. sounded like he was up for it. He said he was up for MMA as well. I think all accounts that would be. Uh, you'd have to get some training in for that because he'd be strong. Oh, he would be. Like, yeah, yeah. Grab, it, it, Gra- it if you would, had to grapple with him, yeah. it'd be harder, wouldn't it? It definitely suit him to, to. I think personally, do do UFC because he's from his rugby background. Do you know what I mean? And um, it's just he's such a strong bloke. 18, 19 stone. I played rugby with him. We we were we were. I was lucky enough. Obviously, headlined through uh, Bill Frost Rugby Club. They'd done a charity match. Midwell select team against Bill Fierce about three years ago, and um, Andy, um, good old Jeremy Pugh, he got Andy Powell to come down to the to the pitch on a, on a bloody golf cart, didn't he? <laughs> and there was there, I think there was about seven, there was close to a thousand people watching, and um, I played rugby with him, and I just just he is a strong, strong bloke, and yeah. you could understand if he was at his peak physical condition, like he's doing damage to anyone, it doesn't really matter who he is, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? So um, I just like I said, I wish Andy 
all the best. And if he wants to get involved in future events, um, hopefully after COVID, we you know we can yeah. we can get him involved. Like that, there's probably a lot to setting up an MMA event in there because there's so many different skills. So many like yeah. you're probably going to get someone who's going to come in who's like who does jujitsu, or you're going to get someone who comes in who does boxing. So it's yeah. like it's probably more difficult to match people. It it was yeah it was. Luckily, you know, we, we I did have an event, but it got cancelled with COVID. Yeah. Um, you know, I went through, got the insurances. Insurance was a little bit different um, because it was MMA, not boxing, and it wasn't sanctioned and stuff like that. Um, but we managed to get the insurance through, uh, I think it was back March, and then all of a sudden COVID came involved and it just put a down on it. And we'd, I'd managed to go back to Gwyn Penmine, um at Penmine Farm and, like, just I'd give them a shout while we were talking. I was, they've been they're fucking excellent. Yeah, what it's a, a good, it's a good event. venue. What, right? a, what a venue! They've got everything there. They've never been no issue. Do you know what I mean? A lot, of, a lot of places. Um, one of the reasons to go back to the pavilion, because they sort of put a lot more pressure on me as like taking it old in the event there than they should have. You know, they got they had a bit of responsibility to themselves, and they tried to put too much on me in the second one, and I wasn't comfortable with it. So I, I obviously went back to Gwyn after doing the second one, and with my tail between my t- <laughs> between my <laughs> legs, because um, I did sort of boy him off to do that UFC event. But fair play, Gwyn being Gwyn. He's um he's obviously the mayor of Bilf now as well. Um he he just he took me back and said, Yeah, just do it as a businessman. You know, it made sense and stuff like that. And um it was all, all ready to go. Um I think we had uh well, we had two, we had uh what's it uh, from the UFC now? I think you had him in a couple of days, didn't you? Not Jack Shaw, the other one. Brett uh, Brett Johns. Not Brett Johns, there's one more. <laughs> Jack Marshman. That's it, Marshman. Yeah. Yeah, so, I haven't added him. I'd like to have him in, but yeah, he's not responsive. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so he he Jack Mar- Marshman was going to come up. He was going to be a celebrity guest that night um, with, with a couple of his mates and from the UFC and stuff like that. And it, it was that was going to be a great thing to do as well to announce. You know, we announced they're all on Facebook. You know, UFC fighter Mid Wales going to come up and do all that. And that event would have, I think, would have been the best event of them all, just because simply fact that no, none of the lads were UFC fighters. They were all local. We I didn't get no away fighters this yeah. time. I managed to get. 10, 10 fight uh, ten ten bouts, twenty fighters, all local lads fighting against each other. So it's pretty much just like your local rugby lad fighting against your local football lad. Yeah, yeah. And and just lads that think you know, think they're something about themselves, a little bit tasty and 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 a way to go and it's fair play to all of them. They got a lot of balls to, to do that. Do, do you think I I expect like you doing that third event made you realise like it must have been really hard to fight and organize it, wasn't it? Because it's like two different pressures, isn't it? Because you, yeah. you, it's got to be hard to worry about how the nights go in, and then think I have got to get in there and fight. Of course, yeah. Do you yeah. think you'd do that again, or are you? No, I d- definitely, definitely, just stick to this fucking microphone in my head. It's a lot, it's a lot easier because it's something I find quite natural to do. A lot of people couldn't get up in front of seven hundred people and uh, and start chopping and talking and stuff like that. But it's um, something I quite enjoyed, um, especially calling in some of the lads who, who could make some mine. Getting to call them into the ring is a bit of a proud moment as well. Like, and I, I absolutely thrived on that. I didn't. I'll be honest with you. I probably wouldn't get back in the ring again. Um, you know, I'm 37 now, bit of a businessman now as well, and um, I just it fucking hurts. <laughs> <laughs> and if you go in the ring against someone that knows what they're doing as well, it's you're gonna get different story in it. 100, 100. You're gonna get tuned in, and it's not gonna be very nice. You and I, I've had a, like a play wrestle with Scott, and Scott does a lot of wrestling. Does yeah, and like he's not really, you know. He does a lot of wrestling with people who, who who know a bit about it, but he doesn't, you know, he's not like training like the higher levels again. Yeah. He just him, he just throws me around like like I'm nothing. Do you know what I mean? And I'm a lot heavier than him as well. Of course, yeah, yeah. That's that's the thing about him. They they're trained to do it, and they and they, they know, know what they're doing. They know exactly what they're doing, and they, it's just it's, I think go moving forward. It's definitely for me. I'll just be sort of the promoter, and um, it's where I'm comfortable at. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I put myself out there a bit too much. It's a good way to like put a rocket on it. And yeah, get it going on yeah, it. Fighting Andy yeah, is like 100%. a good way to get yeah. name recognition. And definitely. And I don't think, like, without blowing smoke up my own ass, there's no one, there's no one's done what, what, what me and Sammy between us have done. Yeah. So, I mean, we've, we've held three boxing events. We've had, I think, the, um, I think it's close to 2,400 and some people over that, over that three events. You know, we've had 60 odd bouts. No one's been injured. They, they're just, they're great events, you know, and, um, I think the the only way to go forward is don't don't stop them, but they will get boring eventually, and they will the crowds will die. But because there's nothing, no one doing this in Mid Wales, uh, that's why people are thriving so much. Do you know what I mean? You get to dress up in your smart suits. It, and, if you can uh, do one a year, one a year be plenty. One a year, yeah. You know definitely. what I mean? There's gonna because like you think about it now, one a year. There's going to be next year. There's going to be someone else who turns eighteen, nineteen. Do you is, know what yeah. I mean? Who's going to yeah. think? Oh yeah, I fancy that this year now. It is, yeah, yeah. And uh, to be fair, that 
on a second event that we did, there was a few kids involved in stuff like that. Um, they were training through Nick's gym and stuff like that. And fair play to them, you know, young lads getting in the ring and stuff like that. But I wasn't all about that. Like, but I let them do it. Do you know what I mean? They, they you know, it's nice to have the family there and watch their sons and stuff fight. I, you know, I, I'm not going to go against them with that. But it was sort of the events and the promotions I was doing with getting like ring girls there. Do you know what I mean? And all of a sudden you've got like, you, you know, you've got a girl walking around in a fucking underwear and then you've got like a lad <laughs> there who's like nine years of age and he's about to get in the ring with a head guard on. You just think, shouldn't really have mixed the yeah, two they together. Yeah, they don't really go, do yeah, they? Yeah. I did have a few people message me after saying that, you know, they weren't comfortable with uh, kids fighting on the events and stuff like that. Because obviously there's alcohol served there as well and stuff like that. So you've got to be a little bit... It's a learning tricky. experience, isn't it? It so is, mate, like it, as is. Well, so. it is. And it's something that... I went in blindfolded, really, didn't I? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. To all of it. And um, it's a massive learning curve. And someone, like, I put myself out there, so I'm always into open to interpretation to... to, yeah, you, to and no matter slated. what, yeah, you, like, take some of it on board, the productive yeah, stuff. Definitely, take it on yeah. board, listen to it. Don't read too much into everything, though, because, like, I've had hate doing this. Like, I've had a few people messing me, give me shit. Really? Yeah, let's have it. Like, you know, I, I just look at it, like, right... I'm putting myself out there. I'm giving yeah. it a go. If you don't like it, switch it off in it. Too I'm right. not going to listen to you. I'm going to do what I think is right. But I bet they still watch your shows. Well, they must be. <laughs> <laughs> to give me shit, innit? How do they, they hate, know what they're giving haters, me shit Haters, no matter what you do, haters are your, are your best followers. Like, do you know what I mean? They, so, they yeah. say they hate you on, on Facebook or Instagram and stuff like that. Then, then people, like... They, they 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 follow you. They're the first person to talk about you when you put that status up, when you've done this, <laughs> when you've done that. They say they're not, but they are, so... Yeah. Well, that's it, mate. And, like, I've only ever tried to spread a positive message, like, do you know what I mean? That's yeah. the aim. We want to show people what's possible, like someone like yourself coming on, just talking about what you've done. Like, yeah. someone's going to take from that and think, fucking hell, if he can do it, I can do it. Definitely, and that's yeah. what it's about, isn't it? Like, it's basically, like, probably a lot of things that I've learned f- through through my mum, really, who's uh, probably the strongest person I've ever met in my life. She's basically... But, she just gave me that drive of um, just believe and believe in yourself and do what you want. Do you know what I mean? I, you know, I'm a fucking council rat, really. Do you know what I mean? There's nothing wrong with that. Do you know what I mean? I my upbringing isn't wasn't the very best. Do you know what I mean? I come from uh, obviously you know, a broken family, and you know, mum's second marriage wasn't the best, and we ended up moving from when I was five years of age to about seven. We moved to twenty different places. Um, under witness protection because mum's second marriage and the, who she was involved with was involved with a lot of dodgy people and really yeah we, we started off because I'm I'm, a, I'm I'm an English lad believe it or not so um, that kind of tell, yeah. <laughs> yeah with a Vanish accent but um we sort of mum was involved with someone who was a very nice char- character I was only young at the time and obviously my older brother and older sister would probably know more about it than me but um we moved around from refuge to refuge from the age of five till about seven eight. Yeah. Um. We lived in Orbington in London, bloody Cambridge, Oxford. We shipped around the place loads, trying to just not because we were witness protection because we were going to uh, go. Mum was going to court against someone. It's just because they were they were just after us. They wanted the blood of you know of, of my mum's relationship. They wanted you know to hurt hurt him as much as they could by going after us. So eventually, uh, scary shit. It was yeah, but I was. I didn't realise it was that scary because I was so young. Yeah. You know, but like obviously it affects you later on in life and, you know, but um, I look back at it now and it's fucking nuts. You know, we moved around so much and luckily, we, you know, we come we come to Brecon. Um, through We had to get out of where we were because we, we had, we, they got wind that, that these people knew where we were. So me and my family, my mum just packed up and that, that was it. We had no, you know, no clothes, no nothing. It was just a bag gone. We managed to come to Brecon for a couple of years. I think it was about seven, seven years of age, something like that. I went to primary school there for a year, settled in a little bit, and I quite liked it in Brecon. It was a tidy little, tidy little town, and um, we got offered then a place in Landord, and it was a new refuge. It was uh, back in nineteen ninety seven, I think it was. A long time ago, isn't it? <laughs> and um, it was a brand new refuge. Um, funnily enough, it's behind where I li- where my mum's house is now that we lived for thirty years. Uh, it's brand new. We got asked to move there. Uh, we took we took it up because obviously it was all new facilities and stuff like that, and um, it's a bit surreal really going to primary school knowing that you lived in a refuge because you got bullied for it quite a lot. Really, you know? yeah. Oh yeah, it's fucking weren't nice at all. And um, but that's where me as a person started sticking up for myself. I started getting bullied in primary school a little bit. But some of the lads who are mates of now, do you know what I mean? They used to give me shit for wearing the same clothes to fucking high, to primary school. You know, a week on a trot and stuff like that. And um, it's sort of that sort of toughness, I had to, I had to get it myself because no one else is going to stick up for me. Do you know what I mean? So I totally had to I, I had to get that mentality and that's something that I got from my mum, that strength of everything she's been through 
in her life, like just traipsing the country, worrying about, you know, her kids, whether they're going to be safe, what's going to happen, you know, and we were lucky enough that we, we come to land on and we settled there and, um, you know, we lived there now since 1907, so it's a long time ago, 20 odd years, whatever. Yeah, 24. And yeah. Um, land on's part of me now. Um, I l- loved growing up there, absolutely loved it. Um, it's such a lovely place. Um, and it's it's got a bad name at the moment, like there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of drugs about land on at the moment and it's not, just your normal drugs, there's a lot of smack heads there, and they've moved in, I don't know the fuck they're from, because they're not local people, I know they've got to live somewhere, but it's it's hard to see your town when you grow up, and you do care about it so much, yeah, you know, because yeah. it's, it's, it's part of you, it is, of you growing up, and um, to see its demise, but it is getting back here slowly, like, you know, through a, a lot of, you know, I think local people, 90% of the people that live there are hard-working people. Um, you know, they're all tidy. They have their little rants on the land. On. Are they, like, housing loads of people who've been to prison and stuff? Yeah, is it, basically, is that, yeah. What's yeah. happening there? Basically, one part of land odd, from, like, the middle of it, um, going out all out to the Ridgeborne as you come in, They're all it's all townhouses. They've all turned into flats, see? So, yeah. um, I, I went years ago that someone, one of the blokes who owns a flat here, he owned a load of blocks of flats. He was advertising in prisons for people to come out and uh, like uh, that's it because he's, he's getting the money off the government yeah, yeah straight, straight in. in his pocket yeah, straight in his pocket he easy money fun, like yeah, yeah. and then it's just but luckily those flats some of those flats had been re, you know renovated and they've been kicked them out and it's not that I'm saying they you know they, they've obviously got a lot of issues and stuff like that do you know what I mean they, you know these people they need help and there is a kaleidoscope in Landod so that's probably one of the reasons why they're coming here as well because they've obviously got to attend kaleidoscope appointments and stuff like that it's not that I'm hating on them you know, everyone's got a choice in life, and some of them, some people, those choices don't get helped today. So it's um, it it is hard life on them. I do I do understand, that. but sometimes you just it's fucking hard driving through town and to see see them. You know, they just they're not getting the help that they need. They, well, they can't because they're they're still yeah. there two or three years later, still. You know, it's like down. a recurring cycle, isn't it? It seems to be. Yeah, it is, and um, I just, we've living in Land Odd, and um, you know, I absolutely love the place now. You know, I live. I moved away for four or five years down to um, down to Bronklease, and that's obviously when uh, I fell in love with a little town called Cacao Rugby Club. Uh, <laughs> um, absolute great people down here. Um, played rugby here for for two years down here, and um, absolutely loved all of it. Like what a, I've never been to a club where they, everyone was so welcoming. You know, you've got like Blair Carrington as old man. Steve, like I, I love Steve. He's an absolute. Do you know yeah. Steve? Talk? Yeah, yeah. He literally lives over the way. Yeah, I thought he did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, I used to go up there when I, I had to collect my money for playing. No, I'm just <laughs> and, um, yeah. So uh, I, they, I, I was, didn't want sure what I was going to do with rugby. I obviously, wasn't when I moved down in the area. I didn't quite like Gunnarvid much because was, was, I thought it was a little bit click, clicky. Um, I come from obviously being uh, like first team manager at Belf and left there, and um, I wanted to be involved with the club because I love it. You know, you're involved with something, you feel part of something, and. Um, I wasn't good enough for Brackham by far. Um, so I went to Crick and I knew within the first 10 minutes of being in Krakow that I'd be here for a long time because yeah. it just got accepted by all the boys. They accepted me for who I was. And, you know, we had that season where we, we'd we done a double. We, we undefeated uh, under Gareth Bowen and uh, Jim Arlett. Like them. You got some characters there as well, haven't you? Like Cannon oh, and stuff oh, and John Jones. And absolute creatures. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. They call me a creature, but uh, no, I, I had, I've had a fantastic time in there. And the rugby... We played. It just goes to show, like six boys from that team, that double winning team, went on to play for Brecon first after the the following years, and four of them actually started in the cup final. Yeah. Um, when they won it, like, and it so just shows the standard of lads we had down there, like you know. And um, I just remember we we, we were so good. Our scrum was so good. Do you know Ken at all? Bitch. Oh, yeah. What a fucking rock. And I, I had a privilege. <laughs> How old is he now? He's been playing for he's years. He's like 70, 80, is he? <laughs> is he still playing? Or? <laughs> no, I, I think he probably was. I don't know if his missus is going to let him play any longer, but yeah. he, he said he, he was going to retire, and I see him playing a couple of times last, uh, last season. Um, I had a privilege of sticking my fucking head up his ass as a second row with me and Lu- young, Lu- <laughs> young Lewis Logan, um, who's an absolute cracking player as well. But one player stood out for me when I went to Crick, and um, that's Harry Summers. He yeah, just, I don't really know him, but oh, I know of him, like sort of thing. You look at him, honest God, you you shouldn't, he shouldn't be playing rugby. You look at him, he looks like Harry Potter. He looks like a little, like just like a little space <laughs> head from somewhere. But he's the most naturally in in my fifteen years of playing rugby, he's the most naturally talented rugby lad I've ever seen. I think I think so effort, effortless with him. He's is is his handling, his tackling, and he's tough. He's got this hand off. Just you look at him, he, he, honest God, he looks like ten stone. Yeah, and I've seen him hand off props and go past them like they're not even there, and um. 
I always remember the game with Harry. That I knew he was, he was that good when um, we went down to Triga and we had to win. It was like one game before the end of the season. It was we had to go down and beat him, and it was between us and them for the league. And they Triga, they pump money, and they say they didn't, but they fucking did. They had a Fijian playing for him. Like he's he's not local Triga, Triga is he? Like, <laughs> um, and you know they they had it was all or nothing for them. And uh, with us quick boys, we we kept quiet all season, you know. And they were the ones that were shouting off and everything. And you know, it's like. Go up there, up to Tradiga, and honest God, I think the whole Krakow were up there. And yeah. they, that was a good thing about Krakow, that the, the town followed the boys' rugby everywhere. Like, And I loved all of that, because you get after the game, people didn't even know. All right, they come up to you and they do a pint, and it made you feel part of something. Then, do you know what I mean? And um, after that first scrum we had, and we, 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 I said to the boys, like, this is the one now. You know, we had fucking uh, Andy Nichols, Ginge from Brecon, and, and Ken, and me and Lewis Logan. And there's not one of us are under 50, 16, 17 stone now, do you know what I mean? And, <laughs> and we pummeled Tradiga. I can went straight over them, put them back on their ass, um, and we had a penalty. And that was the first minute of the game, and that set the scene then for us winning. Like, and uh, I was lucky enough, <laughs> believe it or not, it was the second round, but he'd done the kicking, <laughs> so I managed to do a conversion from the halfway line and put it slotted over. And um, literally, that set the scene. And Harry, I remember he went. We had like a mall, and it was not long to go. And all of a sudden, Harry just he he, he had the ball from a mall, yeah. and he'd, he'd gone under the post, and that sealed it for us then. And that was a like, night. Wow. I'd say a night to remember. I can't remember much of it, but it yeah, was a uh, yeah, best ones. Oh, it was a be- bus trip. We had such a bus trip. We come back and we just, well, we t- we we did paint the town red that night. Yeah. Like it was an absolute crack. And then to go on after that, and I was sadly enough, I I was on holiday. Um, I uh, missed the the cup final that they that they played. They beat Westmont. Yeah. Um, I was on holiday, and it's, it's quite a funny story because I must have looked like a nut job. But I was at, I was at uh, on a, having a bit of a posh meal with a bird that I've seen at the time, and um. I was I had my phone between my lap, my gap, watching the Krakow chat through because they were going, and I knew they were playing. I was absolutely gutted that I wasn't there, and um, kept looking down at the score. And all of a sudden, I think one of the boys scored, and I fucking jumped up like a lunatic. Beer went everywhere, and the other time was just staring at me like I was some absolute lunatic. And I was just like, <laughs> over a local game of rugby. Oh like yeah, the, yeah, and I was, I was, I, was, I was in Cyprus. I think I was yeah. like that, and I was like, fuck, come on, the boys. And yeah. I went to the bar, a couple of Jaegers, and I said, what's the matter? I thought we've done a double like, and it to be involved. All of them boys, like Gareth Bowen, and Jim Allett coaching down there, and Steve Cairns and all them boys, they we'll all remember that for the rest of our lives. That won't ever. I know it's only you know lower leagues rugby and stuff like that, but um, it doesn't matter what you do. It's, it's the memories you you know you make That's when it. you're doing them in it, and uh, it was that I'll remember that forever. Like the good memories I've done, yeah. and hopefully, if COVID does fucking do one, then hopefully you know there might be one le- season left for me if I, if I if I get in the team that is anyway. They, <laughs> I think they're quite good now anyway. So you um, plan to go back to Crick then? Love to, yeah. love to, love to. Like it's, it is a bit of a trek for me, but um, they've always Crick have always helped me out. They've always you know they're always happy to help out pay, paying fuel and stuff like that, and you know for training and that. You know they, they've never paid players, but they've always they make it. Everyone that's involved in Crick, they make you p- feel part of it all. Makes you know, it accessible for you to be able to even be there. Like exactly, yeah. yeah, of course it is, yeah. And um, I, you know, I can't take it away from any of them boys. I, I love them all the bits and the memories I've got. Some of them I got, we can't obviously say on here because they're, they're naughty, but <laughs> um, yeah, the memories that I, I'll cherish for, the, for you know for the rest of my, my life and all that. And I remember all them boys, and I, I, I still speak to all of them. You know, sometimes on an old Snapchat, they get the old Snapchat off me and stuff like that. And um, yeah, they're a good bunch of boys, looking at fair to them. <laughs> So, I don't know if you want to or not, but uh, you mentioned to me beforehand that you got in trouble yourself at one point in your life. I don't know if you want yeah. to no, go yeah, into I, that. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to um, talk about anything. I, I'm a person that's never shorn away from anything, whether it be wrong or right, do you know what I mean? And I suppose growing up, when I was 17, 18, I was a handful. Mum kicked me out because obviously she couldn't handle me. Uh, Dad wouldn't have out. So, uh, I, I got into a flat. I was in college at the time. And it was amazing because... Because the government, they paid for your flat. They give you 250 quid a week to do what you want. And I was going to college. So I was like, it, it's the, it was the best days of my life. Yeah. But unfortunately, I didn't have I didn't have that sort of father figure to kick me up the ass. No guidance. like No, uh, no guidance whatsoever. And um, I was, unfortunately, learned the wrong way in a tough way. like you know, And um, I got involved after sort of a, a bad relationship. I, you know, I never touched drugs till I was about 23, I think. And... Um, I got into a bad, bad place where I, I started after a bad relationship. My head had gone, and I turned to drinking drugs on, on a recreational use, basically on, on, on most weekends for yeah. about for about three or four years. And um, it got a bit out of control. Out of control was to say that we ended up at a house party. It was at my flat, um, and there was a you know a large amount of cocaine there. 
uh, police come through the door, <laughs> caught me red-handed. Um, basically, I it was my flat, you know, and it's sort of basically um, I had to take the rap, you know, and it, 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 I I'm not hiding behind it, you know. We we did have a, a large amount of drugs there for for me and the lads were there, and um, it's something that you know I I can look back now ten years later. And I think, you know, what the hell went on? But unfortunately, I got sent, I had a custodial sentence for two years. Um, not for offering, to, uh, not for intent to supply. I got done for offering to supply, which is basically having a house party and having cocaine on the premises and then offering them because there was uh, no money transactions and no text right, okay. messages or nothing. It's basically just me offering them, having a house party with a load of drugs there, basically. Yeah, and yeah. It, thankfully enough, David Paris Police... It's weird me thanking them now, but they did. They did. Um, some of the local uh, people that work for them, they did write a statement saying that you know we do believe that Mister Davis is not a drug dealer. He's just been caught his pants down. Um, I was lucky enough to undergo uh, alcohol and drug therapy before I got before my court case, which uh, that helped me a lot. Um, it was weird because back in the day when I was 18, 19 and I was fighting around town and having this name for myself as just a fucking local idiot really and that's all it was but I didn't see it like that I thought it was fucking pretty big spuds you know what I mean yeah. I thought I was you know I thought I was a man walking around and I'd, I'd done a lot of stupid things I hurt a lot of people and i come close you know after 250 hours of community service I thought I, I can't go this long in my life now probably not, not hitting someone because I had that sort of temperament in me and that stemmed yeah. from it's all stemmed from you know, my childhood and trauma, and it like a it, little bit it stays yeah. with you, and you you probably don't even know. No, you didn't know how no. to address it. I expect no, either. Uh, and it's not that I'm blaming blaming everything on my childhood because you know part of my childhood was good, but I've never had that fucking father figure in my life to to kick me up my ass when I was doing something wrong. My mum tried with me, and don't get me wrong, I loved it a bit. She fucking tried so hard, and that's probably why it's made us so close now. But um, you know, I, I got sentenced to two years uh, in prison. Um, it was. Fucking massive eye opener. Basically, I I went down to Merthyr Crown Court. Got adjourned the first time um, uh, through some phone evidence or some bullshit that they said uh, some copper tried to say that basically the, the text messages were more than what they were. So they went and they had to pay for a full phone analysis. Went through the text messages. Come back then, um, and the starting point for the amount of drugs that we got caught with um, was three years that was there. So um, with the references I had for work. The stuff that I tried to do with the drug and alcohol uh, counselling and stuff like that, and lucky Devon Powers Police, they did write a statement for me as well. So um, I I got sentenced to two years. So um, what was, was that, what was that day like? The feeling? It's a weird, it's a worst day of your life. It is without a shadow of a doubt. I don't care whether you think you're fucking hard and you're this big man. It's the worst day of your life. Um, you get a lot of people that say your oh, prison's easy. It can be, and it was towards the end. I'll admit that. But that day of going into that court and not coming out and then going down to the, the unforeseen, not knowing what the fuck is going to happen. Um, you know, and I, I got sentenced in Murpha and then um, went down into the cells and I was just fucking, you know, quite a big lad, rugby lad and thinking a lot of myself, what a fucking cry my eyes out. I bet, mate. I bet there's not many people who don't, is there? No. Unless no. they like been there before, maybe. Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. Because they know the system, do you know what I mean? And um, the things you see in prison, like, you know, and it was quite mad. <clears throat> Sorry, it's quite mad really because... Uh, I got, got shipped to Cardiff then. Um, I stayed there for about a month and I fucking hated it because it's a shithole. It's it's literally an old Victorian. It is. Cardiff, Nick, is what you see on those old prison films. It's, yeah. it's, it's The condition's not good. Um, and it is just one of them. It's run run by the... It's a HMP proper. It's run by the, the government. So you've got seven or eight screws on each wing. And you fuck about, you're getting twisted up. You're getting hurt. And there's a lot of dangerous people in there. It, it, with any prison, but I thought Cardiff was a very edgy, very multiracial prison like you know what I mean there's all sorts of people from all backgrounds you don't know you know you walk in you'd be having a shower next to a fucking murderer do you know what I mean yeah so it was and I opened a Cardiff and then because obviously I, my sentence was over two years um they shipped me out to uh to Bridgen and I didn't know I was like said the boys oh it's fucking park like and they said ah oh, it's like a walk in a park so I thought oh, right oh and to be fair compared to Cardiff it was and not 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 hot not 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 like a walk in a park but it was a lot easier than Cardiff because only through the fact that I thought you there's a lot more opportunities that you could do when you're in prison and um so after a while being in being in park and you you know you, you see a couple of lads that you sort of recognize from your area and stuff like that and uh, there wasn't many for Midwells you know for cool yeah. but I, I knew a couple of lads and I was lucky enough to get 
on a, an enhanced wing and two of the screws there played rugby for kayaks rugby and they'd recognize me from when I used to play for Land Dodd. <laughs> Come up to me and uh, had a big chat with them and I was lucky enough to um, get a job then as a rugby coach in prison. Yeah. So I was, my job then basically was going out with with obviously the screws and then going with another lad who was, who was with me, a lad called Lloyd Jones, who used to play scrum half a fucking Neef. Um, he was my cellmate and um, we used to go out and coach lads then of like all all abilities, all shades of, you know, all all different backgrounds and everything. But they'd go out and they'd enjoy it and we'd go out three times a day for an hour for an hour each time. You yeah. take ten boys from one wing, ten boys from another, play touch rugby and everything. And it was great. You know, I was I was loving it then. Well I wouldn't say loving it, but I was loving it as much as you could. Yeah, like, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And um it was always hard because like I was in a relationship then as well. And that was a test in time. Um because it was just one of the things you just it's a fucking ultimate trusting in it. You're in here and you can't do anything about it and she she, you know, she's out there and it's Christmas and she's going on the piss. And it it's, plays with your head, doesn't it? Oh, fucking mental. Absolutely. Christmas and New Year's Eve is the worst, like, in it, because, uh, like, I never... There's a lot of drugs in prison. And until you go in there and you see it, you won't fucking believe it, like... You hear it all the time, don't you? Like, I watch a lot of that James English podcast. I don't yeah. know if you see that. Yeah, it's good, it's good, yeah. yeah. And yeah. he's got a lot of people who've been to prison on there and he's always talking to them about it and they're always saying how much drugs is in there. And it's quite hard to believe that that would be possible, isn't it? But imagine, you, can get, you can get your hands on pretty much anything in there. If you've got the money, you can do what you pretty much want in prison. It's, yeah. They say it's all, it's got to be... Like, I never look too far into it because I sort of... I had it's the only time and I'll be honest with you that that first night when I went into um into Cardiff Nick and I was they put me in I was in induction wing and um they put me up in a cell right in the corner and it's it's probably as you look at Cardiff prison from the from from the road at the entrance it's a run right in the top it wasn't it? fucking seagulls wouldn't shut up all night in <laughs> but um that's the first first time I've um <coughs> I've uh, I sat at the bottom of the bed I did not I, I fucking prayed I just I've no I'm not a religious man but. And in a weird way, I can see why a lot of people in prison turn turn to religion. Um, something to put your trust in, do like, you know, something to... It's just, I think, when, you, when you've when you tried everything in life, you've tried to be that sort of person, like, you know, like, you've gone and turned to drugs, turned to alcohol, you, you're a criminal, you've done this, you've done that, you've done good, you've done bad. I think if you're not a religious person, when you go into prison, you think it's the only thing you've got left um, to try and help yourself better. And, like... Um, you know, I went to Bible studies one time, and, I, and it's not that I'm taking the mic out of him or anything like that. But uh, I remember sitting talking to a lad, and um, he said he he'd been he was a, he was a marine, he was, and he said that he he saw the he saw the light, and I was like, well, what fucking light? It's pretty dark in here, and he's like, no, no, I was on, I was on a ship once. He said that uh, out in um, I can't remember it was it Congo somewhere, or North Africa or something. He was out there, and um, he had he had a moment where he saw he thought he saw God, like, and that's what made him. Because I said to him, how, what? What, how do you believe? Why do you believe? Like, isn't it? Um, and he said, you know, he saw a light on a boat, like, isn't it? And it come down and it, and it, it was spiritual and everything. And yeah. ever since then, he, he turned to it. I personally, I thought it was a fucking boat probably coming towards him. But, uh, <laughs> but, um, but they, he was, you know, you meet so many lo- like tidy lads in prison. Um, and I, to the general public, I just say to people that, you know, everyone makes mistakes. Like, do you know what I mean? I, I met a lad in there. Um, I'm not going to say his name because obviously, I, you know, I haven't spoke to him for a while, so I don't really want to put his name out on Facebook. But he was Welsh rugby and the 16s, 17s, 18s, 19s, 20s, capped. Absolute class rugby player. Um, went out on a night in walkabout. He was downstairs in Cardiff, Wales International, mental day. Someone had dropped a couple of pints, plastic pints from uh, up above, and he's gone up, like, soaked him and his missus. He's run up there, filled two of the three of these lads in. Ended up getting done with Section 18 three times. He broke two two of the lads' jaws. Done seven years. It's insane, isn't it? How quick it can be turned around like that. Couldn't cause... believe it. Like I, he was he was the one person I felt so fucking sorry for because I went up to his room and saw it. It's like a fucking shrine in it. it was of all his games and pictures and all his medals that he won for playing rugby Wales. And he said to me, "Dig thirty fucking seconds of my madness. It's cost me seven years." Like and when you look at it like that and you think, "Do you know what? It can it can fucking happen to anyone." And um, you've got. I've always found, and I've been very lucky that I haven't been I haven't been in police in trouble once since I got out of prison. That's um, good, mate, because people get caught in a cycle, don't they? They do, yeah, yeah, and I can see why they do because I I was quite lucky I come out back to the job straight away. I had uh, you know a home to go to, a job, so everything's set there, and it. Do you know what I, mean? I was on tag for for four months, but I think tag was great because it gets you back into that 
that that sort of work. You get up in the morning, you're allowed to go out at seven o'clock, but you've got to be back by seven o'clock. It's a routine. Like. Routine, and that's what that's what these these, these you know people that reoffend all the time. That's all they need. But when when they're going to prison and they're they're coming out and they got fuck all and they get all they got to turn to back is the drugs and alcohol. It's only a matter of time before they're fucking back in there. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. I don't believe prison rehabilitates you. I think it's yourself and your head of if, just just you don't want to go back there. If if there's drugs and that in there, or, and people can get that, and yeah, I bet there's people in there making money. Is there? <laughs> Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, so yeah. Like, well, one you? one bloke I knew that obviously he was a couple of cells down from me. And fucking, I sound like a snitch. I'm gonna get loads of people chasing me. <laughs> but um, I asked, I I was just I was amazed. I said like, mate, how, what's going on? How how does this work? Like it and just going on about how you know mobile phones and there and stuff like that and it, you just wouldn't believe and they're making five grand a week he's even fucking behind the door why would you want to be out maybe in it <sighs> Too or right. just come out when you've uh yeah exactly. done enough like exactly but like for me prison was one of them things was a massive opener and i was lucky enough to have so many people my mates they come down every week uh, and the girl, girl that was with then um she'd come down most weeks to, and i had that support i had a family that basically supported me the whole way through it and that's what got me out and wanted to, you know, to be the better side. It, it, it was just so easy for me to come out and go back into the normal thing of work and stuff like that. And I didn't ever want to go back to that where you lose all your fucking loved ones. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because I imagine being in prison, you lot, and someone, you, you know, you lost a loved one or something like that. All the shit that's going on with COVID now. Imagine being in prison now, and, and you know, you one of your parents passed away. For, it's just, it's just. You feel like guilt, wouldn't you? You'd you feel do, massive yeah. guilt, I'd imagine. Yeah. I expect you felt guilt for like, well, obviously. That put your mum through some strain, I would imagine. And it stuff, did, yeah, they, you know? it did, yeah. You know, and bless her, like she's, um, she's had a fucking tough one, mate. You know, she's, uh, she's battling cancer now, as you know, and she's. I don't know where the fuck she gets the strength from. I really don't. I think it's bred. You know, she's in her fif- mid fifties now. I think that era of people are just fucking hard, and they, yeah. I mean, they just, you know, my mum's my mum, and I always say to mum, "You're right," you know. You're like, yeah, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. And you know she's not, but she won't fucking tell you that she's not. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I, I, it's, you know, luckily enough, you know, um, you know, I touch wood, you know, I hope she gets through it. And um, but, Yeah, me too, mate. But for as a, as a, as a child to see your mum or your, or your dad or any, any loved one go through that, it's, it's, it's not nice. She's just lucky enough. She's finished now the first six months of chemo. Um, so she's got a, a bit of a stretch off it now, 12 weeks, I think, before they can scan her to find out whether the lump on her lung is, is um, they can operate on it and stuff yeah. like that. But it's, it's all this thing with COVID again. Uh, like, I'm, I managed to, like, like I want to be there for my mum, I want to be there by her side. Do you know what I mean? I want to sit there when she, you know, hold her fucking hand and let her reassure her how she's reassured me over the years. Do you know what I mean? But with COVID, you can't, you feel like all you are as a taxi driver. You t- you, you've got to take him to the hospital, you can't even go in. Yeah. You've just got to take him in and go and then. Six hours later, come and pick him up, and then you're like, "You're right, mum. Yeah, I'm right, and all that." And it's just so you can't, you can only be there so much, and it's it's such a shit time at the moment um, for people that are struggling with illnesses and and life, and obviously people that lose loved ones as well. Do you know what I mean? Because like you can't even give them a fucking send off. I know, I mate. You can't even like. I don't know how they how they work it now, but I don't know if you can be there like in their final moments next to the bed, like it's all that, and it. it's, well, you know, yeah, it's so tough for people. Like it is, and. Um, you know, I went to a funeral about three months ago, and that was for my, uh, my old boss, PJ Martin, and um, he was like, a mass, believe it or not, obviously, you know, he's not my dad, but he was a sort of father figure to me, like, you know, I worked for him for over so long, and he, he was a bloke that you could you could fucking love and hate at the same time, yeah. because some of the stuff, he'd, he'd treat, treat you in work, but it, it, it everything that goes in, it, you know, makes you learn and be, makes you a better person for the future they were just tough love lessons and um you know i got massive respect for, for that man he's um sort of helped me progress now because obviously i've got my own business now and groundwork's been going you know six months now and i got four you know a few lads work for me managed by a digger and stuff um i don't really want to come in and talk too much about work because obviously it's um but f- but you know I, I going in back to like you know aaron pj's son he's a good mate of mine he's you know he's he's done fucking well the last couple of months because not the fact that you know he's lost his He's lost his dad, who you know, who was a massive figure in town, and it's, it's like literally like a time legend just going. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, it, it, I know it's it's it hit a lot of people, and uh, we managed to go to his funeral. Only a you know a close thirty family, and he had a massive family. Do you know what I mean? He's got four or five brothers and sisters, and you know it was only rightly so that they were in there. But um, there was a couple hundred people outside, and I know it would have been fucking triple that. Do you yeah. know what I mean? If we were allowed, but some people who you know people because of COVID they're scared to come. Around where people are going to be, do you know what I mean? Because exactly, of the yeah. 
as you know, as we were lucky enough to get, you know, get in the pub after, and it just, it wasn't a send off he should have had, you know what I mean? Because I remember him saying to me about six weeks before he passed away, he said, uh, there's not a fucking scrap at my funeral, don't bother coming. <laughs> he was that sort of bloke, like, and, um, you know, he's someone I, you know, I'll always look up to, and he learnt me lessons, and some of the lads that have worked with him for over 30 years are still there now, and they help air, and, you know, the son go on to, you know, do good yeah. things and stuff like that. And he's, he's helped me in my business as well, um, you know, I ring him most, you know, every other day, you know, and just talk to him, you know, and he's only been a boss, really, since his dad's passed away, but, but he's, he's sort of, I talk to him quite a lot to get, you know, advice off him and stuff, even though I'm fucking, you know, I'm older than him and I've been doing it longer, but it's so, you know, you know what sort of person he has, is when they're, when they're grieving and when they're in a bad place, they've still got time to help others, yeah. um, and that's the sort of person... It's probably good for both of you to bounce back and forth off each other, isn't it? And a little bit, yeah, yeah. You know, he's, he's, I'm probably a little bit too wild for him at the moment, do you know what I mean? Because he's, <laughs> he's just had a little baby and stuff like that. And, um, you know, uh, he's, he's lucky enough that Peter is still there to, to, to see the birth of his grandkid. And, um, you know, I just wish all, well, wish all the best for Aaron and uh, his family and that because it, it did rock the town, you know what I mean? It was one of those a massive, massive character passing away. And it's like you said, you go back to cancer and it just doesn't fucking pick it. It's, Anyone, anyone, do you that's know what it, I mean? mate. And that's that's kind of the sad things about these times. I totally appreciate the lockdowns and everything like that. It's like looking after people, yeah. But yeah, like you said, the people who were lost in these times, like it's so, it's so weird, isn't it? You yeah, know? and it's it's hard for, for people as well, like you know, who do struggle with mental health. Like, um, I before the Andy Powell fight last year, September, I had a summer where I sort of I went off, I lost my way a little bit. Um, I was in between a couple of jobs and um, I was going out on the weekends and probably going up two or three, three nights in a row. And, um, I just lost my way, lost to who I was. And I, I suffered and they, I had that, that it was weird. Cause I'd, I'd put myself out there so much to please others. And I wasn't getting the fucking pleasure back off it. Like you're doing these events, you're raising money, you're doing good things, but it, I'm st- it was still empty for me. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it's an like, energy exchange, isn't it? You can't yeah. give so much without like someone yeah. topping your pot back up. And then it? sometimes and that was a thing as well. When you d- you'd put energy into it as much as you could and then you wouldn't get it back off someone. And then you just think that I'd just, it, it would, it would, it would break you quite a lot like in it. But, um, moving forward now, obviously like I'm in a good place now. I've, uh, I was lucky enough to do a patio for a woman who's now my uh, partner, Nicola. Um, <laughs> I did a patio back in, must've done a bloody good job because as well, it's, there's no rocking slabs and it's still there anyway. But, um, yeah, I, uh, I met this woman, Nicola, who's my partner now and she's amazing. Like, um, I do generally believe, you know, there is someone out there for everyone. Do you know what I mean? And um, it's took me a long time. If any, you know, any people that do know me, it's took me a long time to sort of settle down and find the right person. Just because of the fact that I was so fucking wild and I had so much baggage and so much, so much people didn't know about me. I I plastered my life on fucking Facebook, but then people didn't really know the real me. And you put out what you want people to see, don't you? Of course you, you do. Yeah, yeah. But it's for their benefit, not yours. Cause, yeah. And then when you, that's where it comes to that mental, you know, the mental health stuff and and that. I, social media is is a great thing for contacting people and uh, you know and stuff like that, but it is an absolute killer for pe- someone struggling. With you get health. it twisted, can't you? You can use 100%. it for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Like I said to you just before we started, I've deleted yeah. my Facebook and Instagram. My phone is gone. I wasted hours of my day not being productive. Gets to ten o'clock at night, yeah. looking at myself in the mirror, saying, "What the fuck have you achieved today?" You do, Nothing. Because yeah, like, yeah. I'm you, scrolling. Do you know what I mean? You can <laughs> lose hours, lose hours on it. Like and. Um, you know, I'm just lucky enough that I've met this person now, Nicola, and it's, it's going well. It's, it's a weird sort of relationship because we started a relationship for, in a lockdown and, and COVID, and normally you like sort of you go out dates and you you know you go off to the fancy places, you try and you know like big spuds and do all this and uh, take them out and posh meals. But it's been the opposite; it's been the reverse. We sort of uh, you know I spend night, you know most of my time living over here uh, in Kington, and then um, I travel back to London for work and stuff. But obviously, it's at the moment I'm sort of um, I'm just, it's a massive juggling act, like because obviously got my, I can't be too close to my mum because I obviously she's high risk with cancer and stuff like that, and I've got my work that's going on, so I've got to be there for work, and then obviously got my girlfriend, and another thing I want to get onto now is probably that you know it's a lot of people as well. I got daughter, look, like, um, all right, okay. Demi, she's uh, 15 now, going on 20, and um, do you know what? It was only three years ago I found out it was a dad. Really? Yeah. Okay, um, I heard about that was a shock. If I'm generally 100% honest with me, I, there, you know, there was a, a massive part of me that probably thought I was Demi's dad. Like, um, I regret it's the biggest regret 
it's worse than going up than me fuck around when I went to prison, not being there. Now, now that we have got such a good relationship now, not being her for there for when she was younger, like um, you know, it come from sort of one night out. Really, you know, I knew her mum because her mum had lived next door to me, and um, there was a lot of a lot of aggro went on between me and me and her mum. She, you know, she fell pregnant with Demi and. I didn't think it was she, that Demi was mine, and then it just got in her argument. Her friends would, you know, give me abuse when we went on nights out. I got into a different relationships. So I didn't want to bring anything to it, and it, it was fucking weird. But then me growing up without a dad, and that's why it's probably I am probably the biggest fucking hypocrite ever because I should have been there for her. me. Me not growing up with dad it should have made me, you know, when you find out you got go a child, the other way, like, go the yeah. other way, yeah. And um, at, at first, you know, I think that stage of my life. When I was in all that trouble at prison, when I was in all that trouble with the police fighting and stuff like that, and just being this idiot, um, I probably would have been a shit dad. Um, not saying I'm the best dad in the world now, because it's all new to me, but I moved back to Landord. I moved back in with mother after you know a bad relationship, and um, sort of, basically, it, she didn't know it, but I needed her more than she probably needed me at that time. Um, I contacted her mum and said, look... Uh, is there a possibility? I know I haven't been there. Is there a possibility I can we can sort sit down and have a chat and do a DNA test and um, see if Demi's mine? And she said yes straight away. Fair I, play to the mother, yeah. Like, isn't it? Cause yeah, and I hold my I hold my hand up to Kim like she's fucking raised. She's definitely Demi's definitely mine. She chops as hell. She won't shut up. And she's about <laughs> six foot already now. So um, um, she's raising a, you know amazing young girl and um. We've got, you know, good contact now. We speak, you know, every day and, uh, you know, we try to get out. This COVID has been another bad thing as well because we went on, we had our first holiday last year. I uh, took my mum and my daughter on holiday for for a week and um, it was amazing because it was, you know, she was 13, 14 and it, it's the first time we'd ever done that. Yeah. First time I'd done it as a parent. First time my mum had seen, took, you know, spent time with a grandchild properly abroad like that. And it, was, it was, you know, first for all of us, you know, it, you know, it was, um, it was a great time and obviously my other, my, my sister come, Obviously, she's um, my half sister from a, from my dad's relationship. She brought her little boy, so like they'd, it was all just like you know, real nice, nice yeah. uh, all that stuff. But um, you know, Demi's grown up now, and she's uh, she's like, well, it's, it's madness. It yeah. is m- madness to think like I, because I'm so childish. Like I, am, <laughs> I no, I am. I'm, I'm like you know, I'm 38 and I'm going on like fucking 15. I still think that I should be you know out in the pubs every weekend and stuff like that. And but it's it's a massive part of me being a social lad, doing everything I can for like rugby, football. I, you know, I used to play football when I was younger, and, and just I've always been out. I've never had that. If I want to go out, and, you know, and I, you can't be. I don't care. I don't know why these women will not understand it, but <laughs> blokes just love being in the pub with their mates, don't they? And it's not <laughs> as if we're not always up to mischief all the time. It's just it's our little tranquil place where we can get out, have a couple of pints with the boys, and just talk shit really, yeah. basically. You know, do you know what I mean? I- and um. I, I kind of steered away from it, but even like just going and play it, like we play five side football or yeah. meet up with my mates and we go do whatever. Do you know what I mean? Like go training, whatever. Just having like that male interaction, like and yeah, definitely. I being think able to rip the piss out of each other and mm. it, and it, it's, it's, de- it's definitely is that mean? It's definitely like you said. It's why have it's been so massively involved with rugby and sports, where it's, it, it's involved a lot of people because I do like I get a buzz off being around a lot of people, and I don't know whether it stems from my childhood. Where I need that, do you know what I mean? Where I need that, that assurance that I feel wanted yeah. by, by by people. Like a lot, a lot of people probably you know they don't know, you know that I uh, I was doing counselling last year before the before Andy Powell's fight, leading up to about a month before. You know I I uh, went to Paris Mines, you know, for a couple of sessions and I had over the phone counselling and stuff like that because um, I don't know it was it was just this massive emptiness inside me. Do you know what I mean? Um, I was sort of acting out to everyone else that my life was great, amazing, you know, and all doing all this and I've got such a big group of mates, blah, 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 but I was fucking lonely, like, do you know what I mean? And it, it get, got to me sometimes yeah. when you're there and you're there in your spare room at your mum's house after a fucking broken relationship and you're like, fuck, I'm back here again, I'm 35, what the hell's going on? And then you just, you sort of got to believe, you know, I read a book on holiday last year and it was, I don't know if you've read it called The Secret. No, I've seen a lot of people talking about it, though. And at first, I thought, what the fuck is this pile of shit? But the more and more you keep reading it, it's almost like the book brainwashes you and it changes your mindset of, if you if you want something in life, it, 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 go and take it, like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Get, it's, it's yours. If you want to be a millionaire, you can be a millionaire. There's ways around everything in life. And um, 
I read the book, the whole book, and it's probably the only fucking book I've ever read, actually, apart from uh, for some football violence. <laughs> um, but um, it it just opened my eyes to everything and just made me, it changed my mindset, basically, into get rid of the people in your life a little bit that are, that are, that are bringing you down a little bit. Get get rid of them. Want better for yourself. And don't be scared to go and do it. Like And um, that's just pretty much me all over, really. I'm quite ballsy, quite gutsy, and... You Just, you got to believe in yourself, like yeah. it's it's um, oh, what is it? Christ, I'm trying to think of the word. You got to you got to believe it. If you don't believe it, it's, it's never going to happen. No. So you may as well believe it, even if it doesn't happen. Like you're going to be further yeah. along the way, aren't you? And I, I think you can't think about it too much as well. You can't think about where you want to be in life. You just got to go. Just get and fucking do it. Like and yeah. there's a lot of people now. You see, there's a lot of people whinging on Facebook about this COVID and stuff like that. And like we we as people, like you know, we're just sheep. Do you know what I mean? We can't do nothing about it. You can have your opinion on Facebook, but it means absolutely bullshit to anyone. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? The, the, like the great thing about us being like, human is the fact that we're all we've all got different thoughts, and you know we all look different, we all act different. You know, you can get some person who, who like like completely you know spec different spectrums. Like will stay in the whole life, they have the quiet family life, you know that. But that's them. That makes them happy. Whereas you get someone who could be a wild child all life and like just live a great you know amazing life, wild life, and then. It's just, there's so many different things, I think, with COVID, and I think, personally, from, like, I didn't really want to talk about it, but my only thing about COVID is that I think the government have handled it wrong, but I do believe that COVID is, like, you get a lot of people saying it's not real, it's not, but it is, it is, of course it's real, it's killing people, and... Um, yeah, yeah, I totally agree. You've only got to agree with, you've only got to look at New Zealand, and they're an island exactly the same as us, we're a little bit bigger than them. As soon as they found out, boom, shut the fucking doors. No one going in, no one going out. Now look at them now. I've got one of my mates, Osh, and over there, everyone knows Osh. Um, good rugby player from yeah. from Murph and that. He's out there now, and he's he's seen his Snapchat and making me fucking sick. <laughs> he's, I, he's been at music festivals. He's been at a pub, and he's there with all his mates. And you just think, fuck, I just want that back. I, I want that I, life back. Like I totally agree. The, the way you look at the, how they've dealt with it and stuff is just totally different to how we've dealt with it. Yeah. And they talk because they wanted to like trickle, keep us going, kind of trickle it on and it, and yeah. keep the economy going. And surely. Easy to look at it from hindsight, isn't it? Yeah. Close down, no to get to no cases, to stop all flights, and then surely it'd be quicker to pick up that way. But it's easy to say after the fact. Yeah. And why is it taking them so long? I, I think realised last Monday, whatever they just said that they're going to stop all flights coming into the UK. So why? why That's insane. Why didn't they do it to start with? Or at least like quarantine, like in New Zealand, I think you can only fly for certain reasons. But I see like UFC fighters and stuff when they yeah. go out to fight. From yeah. Australia, New Zealand, they got to go and do like a two week quarantine in a quarantine hotel afterwards and before, yeah, like before and after. So, surely, and like make them make the people who want to go on these flights pay for it, isn't it? If yeah, that's definitely. part of it. Yeah, but anyway, <laughs> it's happy days. Isn't it's it? easy to get down that rabbit hole, isn't it? Oh, it is. And I, to be honest, I've I've been on Facebook and put my thing out about it, and I've changed. I changed my mind. Daily, but I at first I was like, "No, nah, that's bullshit." No, nah, it's nothing. And then you get people hammering you, and then oh, <laughs> oh, my my fucking second, third cousins twice removed passed away from it, and all this. And then you think, "All right, well, I didn't actually try and like obviously say it's not real, but like it's one of them things until it affects you, until it you lose a loved one or it affects someone that you know, you won't you won't fucking believe it's real. You won't simply. You want another respect for it, maybe? No, yeah. you won't. You won't. But um. I just hope that we, you know, we all, everyone gets back to normal and uh, as soon as possible and, you know, we just obviously fatalities drop and stuff like that and um, I just, you know, we get through it and hopefully the pubs will be open for the summer and, um, but they've just, I heard it's cancelled now. My mate Rory um, from the White from the White Horse and Bill cancelled the World Wars show again this year as they, well. Uh, yeah, so that's the pubs all, the pubs are about a fucking hammering as well, yeah, aren't they? Yeah, mate. Absolutely They'll be gasping right. for a big dig promotion now and uh, it's I all thought, over, isn't it? i got something in the pipeline, no worries. <laughs> Worst thing is, like over the years I've been a DJ. I've been like um, like a DJ at the, at the Royal Welsh show behind the back of one of the pubs and um, back in the day when Landon had a nightclub, we had Dave Pierce up there, you know, Dave Pierce yeah. radio ones. And like I was a DJ back then and like I wasn't a fucking DJ, but I I thought I was. And um, <laughs> like a DJ there for a year, so how the hell I winged it for a year, I'll never know. And then I went on to doing the door work and stuff like that. And it's just crazy. I miss all that being out. Like, and I think back then, because obviously, you know, you get to relationship and you can't go out every weekend. So you've got to lie to them then and tell them you're a fucking DJ, you know. So you've got to go to work, <laughs> don't you? So, um, you might be a DJ this year then, is it? Oh, I don't know. I don't, well, yeah, I, I don't know with this one. I think she's the boss of me. So I think um, I think I better, I think I've got my match in the ring anyway. So uh, I'm definitely going to be um, 
I look to go on holiday. Do you know what I mean? I've worked through COVID. We're lucky enough, and I do feel for small businesses. Go like going back to like next gym and stuff like that, and just just hair like hairdressers, all those people that can't go to work. I know they've had the help of the government, but it's nowhere near the fucking help that they needed or, no, or to I get through or what they would have earned if they were open. Do you know what I mean? It's also that sense of freedom when you're open as well because, you know, they can come, come and go as they please and stuff. And um, I just think it's going to be so good for everyone to get back to normal after after all that. And um, the businesses, the small businesses, I don't know what Crick, how Crick's been affected badly, but they've just been hammered and I... A lot of businesses are going to fail from it, no? Do you know what I mean? I would imagine so. Yeah, yeah. It kind of uh, leaves it for the people who've got the money, who are the bigger businesses, to pick it all up and like capitalise in it, which is the shame as well. Because people really work hard, don't they? To like have their cafe, have their shop, oh, yeah, have their, yeah. you know, their little independent stores and stuff. And uh, they they kind of being phased out as things are going on anyway, isn't it? Fucking it's, Greg seems to be doing all right. They're always open, aren't they? Oh, Greg will do fine, mate. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty essential to me and my boys in the morning. Anyway, at the moment, he's looking there. But um, no, I do wish everyone, like, I, I massive believe in, like, all the local businesses and stuff like that. I hope they do all well, like the local butchers, you know. And we, I've been very lucky as a business because our work's outside. Um, you know, we're, we're just transforming people's gardens and uh, and driveways and stuff like that on the groundworks. We've just been so lucky that the fact that we, we've been able to go out to work and, you know, and, and earn a living. You know, we, we did have a... a when it obviously you know one of the lads um he caught covid so he, he unfortunately Kyle he hasn't been in since uh, since christmas like um he's waiting to get his negative test back so he can come back to work and um you know we have had a bit quite a bit of time off due to it looking at you know yeah, um, yeah. but like I'm looking forward to getting on holiday get, let's get abroad and <laughs> let's get to Spain somewhere in it and just uh hopefully you know just um hope for a better better you know more positive future after yeah. this, after this covid looking at it. and then obviously when all that settles we can look and have a chat about where we want to go next with uh the next events and stuff like that like even covid it affected recently like um i was meant to do a sleep out new uh, yeah new that's year. what i was gonna try yeah and get to yeah, yeah christmas eve and um like last year um i i uh it stemmed from a long time ago because I've always wondered if you you always wondered you know obviously you're nights out and you go especially go to cities and stuff you see a lot of homeless people and you always think what the fuck are they doing there like why would they want to be in a doorway but then you never it never comes to terms of why why are they there why do they still stay there do you know what I mean and um, it, 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 one day I just thought what you know what the fuck is going on with these people like why do they want to stay in a shop door and someone's keeping them there and um, there's a woman Sarah Mason who, who, who's helped the homeless whales they're based in Land Dodd and like this woman is, she is Mother Teresa. Like she is, honest to God, the most unsung hero I, I've yeah. ever met in my life. She's she, her and her and the people that help her as well. I think you know, there's a group of them now. Um, they get a lot of donations from for people uh, like Raider Bill from Landlord donate like food and uh, clothes and stuff. And they go down to Cardiff three times a week, um, and they feed the, feed the homeless. Uh, they, to them. they do, and um, I found out that they were doing it, and I. I probably about 18 months ago and I thought fuck it I'll give up give up my Friday night and I'll go down and see what's all about and help feed, feed them out and at first I'll be honest with you it was for more and I'll be honest with you for more I thought you know what it, it puts my name out there I'm doing something good it was for me but then when you get down there and you meet them and then I met a lad in the in, in the uh in a, in a shop window it was a lad that I, I was quite proud of in prison really yeah and his name he's out now right he's just his leg on Facebook Jay his name is um he, it was so fucking sad because he, I'd sort of worked with him in prison in, in the laundry service for a bit, and he was such a good lad, and you know he had a real good band. He's got like proper Cardiff vibe about him, all right, lad, and we all tied in to see him like homeless after three, you know, five or six years of being out of prison and seeing him there like that, and it just fucking hit home. And I was like, I need to try and do something to try and help, help, help him, help. Wait, like. If you didn't have that family to go back to when you come out, yeah, maybe yeah, be in the yeah. same position, and I expect it's really relatable to you then. Yeah, definitely, yeah. And um, so after that, um, I, well, worst thing I did pick the most, most fucking horrendous rainy day, Friday night. It was fucking hammering down. I got soaked. But I went with one of my girlmates, Sid, who who um, she's unsung here as well. She she goes out then most Fridays and helps out because she I think she lives in Cardiff quite a bit now, and um, I sort of was just amazed at the, the work they're doing, and they're not even getting a fucking credit. Not that they're out there to get credit, but they people don't know about like they we're here for, they're going down on a Wednesday night and a Friday night and a Monday night. We're, we're fucking sat at home having a food and they're they're travelling an hour and a half to go and feed the homeless people and it's absolutely amazing, you know. So 
I thought to myself, what can I do to help him out? Spoke to Sarah Mason, um, and I suggested doing a sleep out. Um, and she said, yeah, it's a great idea. We've had it a long time ago. Someone done it, but what are you thinking? And I said, Christmas Eve. And she was like, you sure you want to go Christmas Eve? And I was like, well, I think it'll hit home to a lot of people on Christmas Eve because Christmas Eve is the time you're meant to be home with your family, innit? do you know what I mean? And um, if I can show people... <coughs> sorry, um, what the homeless people go for on Christmas Eve when they're meant to be at home with the family. And, um, you know, we hopefully can try and raise a bit of money and help them with these sleeping pods that Sarah's yeah. managed to get. And uh, it was a scary night, I'm not going to lie. I uh, got started on a couple of times from homeless people. Um, there was one Somalian gang member who... Who uh, offered me out for a scrap in the middle of the street at four o'clock in the morning? Um, it, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't a nice experience at all. Um, this this one just gone now. Yeah, last yeah. last year. Yeah, not not something. The one just gone now. The one before ah, right, Christmas okay. year ago. Because unfortunately, due to COVID, we went back to Wales. We went back into lockdown. Um, we've raised so far. We raised about nine hundred pounds, but um, until lockdown's over, we can't get back out yeah. to the streets. But as soon as it's open um, and we're allowed to go down there, we will. But. Uh, it was one of them nights, you know, um, one of my girlmates coming in when we were sat, and I felt a little bit bad for her because she was a little bit helpless, really. She came out and we, we decided to do um, the night exactly. We just went around over sleeping back. I said, nothing else, no money. We, you know, we, 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 made, we were lucky enough that we had a book McDonald's on the way down here. Yeah. But um, from six o'clock till six o'clock in the morning, um, we were lucky. We went round and had a conversations with a couple of homeless people, and one story just it ripped my insides out and I was, I was in tears is a lad he was a couple of years younger than me and um he'd lost his family his, his wife and his kids in, in you know in a fire and um about 10 years ago and ever since he's just drugs alcohol is his way of dealing with trying it and numb the pain trying right? to numb the pain and that pain is never going to go away and um bless him he's a lovely lad and like, you could see just having a conversation with him you could see the hurt they still, still there still raw horrible and um you know he tried to get into a house a little bit um, for a bit but it just didn't work out uh, he missed paying the rent and stuff or whatever um, he's back on the streets again and you just think it can happen to anyone and it's homeless people you know you wonder it's 2022 or 21 and you think how oh, the fuck are people still homeless like yeah well I know, I know at the start of Covid I'm sure it was like on Wales Online or something I seen that they were going to house all the homeless were they I think that was a yeah I did see that yeah so like if they can just do it like that why isn't it happening prior exactly. now? Like, there's obviously still people homeless now, isn't there? Oh, just the fucking government do not give them. But uh, the ca- it's the councils it is. Um, I, I know, like you can. It's easy to look at them and think, oh yeah, they got themselves in that position though. Yeah, but at the end got of the day, there. like that's trying to help people who are struggling. In it. And I'm not saying like I haven't done, I haven't done any. Well, we've donated stuff, you know, in the past, course, yeah, like yeah, and yeah. done bits and pieces like that. Because it is hard, isn't it, when you're living in your own bubble, you don't look outside sometimes. Yeah, but yeah. I'd love to try and help to do something like and at some point that, with you if yeah, you're gonna do it. Yeah, like, definitely, yeah. mate, definitely. And it's the one thing that um this time that we we're gonna go down this year, I managed to get four lads. Um one's a journalist of the uh Brecken Radner, Jabba. Um he was gonna come down and obviously j- jump involved and that he, someone that's touched him as well and a couple of my other mates. One is Sarah Mason's boy, uh is obviously his mum out all the time doing it. He works for me as well. So, um, and one of my mates, Will Iron, some Hereford, like, so we were all going to go down and, um, but it was just, it was an absolute shit that it got put on hold because obviously, um, you know, you can't go traveling the car if, uh, just, just to sleep rough. And to be honest, you probably would have got stopped doing it as well. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. By the police and all that. And, um, but like, like going back to that night, it, it was, um, it was touchy. It was touchy at one point because, uh, I, I remember it's like I nodded off about half an hour and it was fucking freezing cold. I tell you what, I, I, I've been out in the cold weather in the day in work, but that was cold, cold. Like And, and um, I literally had to sneak off and I, I'll be honest with you, I had to sneak off to, to the car for 20 minutes to sit in the car to get warm because it uh, we had sleep. Realisation how bad it was. Fucking then, beyond. I couldn't, couldn't stick it anymore. No, the girl, I mean, uh, Rachel, Rebecca Davis, boo, like she, she uh, you know, she was fucking. Uh, we were froze. So we, I said, let's just go out of our house. Which you know, we don't ha- have to do this. We, we, you know, we try our best to do it, but it shows, kind of, doesn't it? Though, yeah, and it shows. Yeah, you know, you can be as big, strong as whatever you are. But what they and I think that's the massive thing of being involved with alcohol and drugs on the streets because it fucking numbs that coldness and that pain that they got inside them. That's you know, it's just there and it's not going away. And um, how do you get out the cycle? And it's the same with the prison thing. And it? it's like the yeah. cycles you get stuck in. It is, Just yeah. re- relive it over and over and over. Mm. But we managed, we were lucky, we we made, we raised, uh, I think it was £1,500, 
uh, for the Help Your Wales Homeless. Um, and they got a shed load of these uh, sleeping pods. Um, they're just like all insulated and stuff like that. And they they keep obviously the homeless warm. They can just wrap them up into a bag and at night they flop out into a little tent. And yeah. You know, it's, it's, it is a worrying time because being homeless and you're, you're in that little tent and you don't know what's going on outside there on the streets. See, and it's a it's a dodgy old place. Like you see people like as well on nights out and stuff, treat them like shit, and you're like fucking assholes. Yeah, and, and like I've seen people doing, I'm like fucking hell, like they're, they're people like, aren't they? Do you of course, know what I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. They're there, they're there because unfortunately life's dealt them, you know, some bad bad cards, and they can't seem to, you know, get the right right way out of it. And um, I generally, I I always used to be that piss head that gives homeless people twenty quid. On a night out, and you think you're doing a good deed, but you're not. Like, trust me, I tell you, you see these homeless people, just go and give them a coffee, go and yeah. give them, a, you know, a bit of food or something like that. And that's that's the best thing you do. And just have a conversation with them. Like, do you know what I mean? It's the, you look at homeless people and you humanize them, like, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Instead um, of dehumanizing them, exactly. Yeah. You're looking at them as if they're like a stray dog, like. Yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And like, I went shopping at Christmas, and um, went over to Hereford, and there wasn't. There's not too many homeless people, there, but but did. There was, you know, a couple of them there, and you think, fucking hell, are these people homeless still? It's, you know what I mean? And I saw fair play to the bloke. Like, I, I see him for, he was queuing and um, out getting a hot dog and a hot chocolate, and I see him walk over and he give it to the homeless bloke, and I thought, do you know what? And I went up to the bloke and I said, fucking fair play to you, mate, because that's, that's humanity. That's what you should be doing to people. Like, that. not looking at them like a, a, a bum, a drug addict in the street. It, 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 do you know what I mean? They, yeah. They've got serious issues. They're not there in their big house in the countryside, and they've been handed down thousands of pounds to their parents, and they're like, do you know what I mean? You've got a nice new car. They haven't been instilled with all the right values. No, exactly. And all the right, course, yeah. Like they've they've found themselves in that place through like yeah, like you said, hard times, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, definitely. Like, and the only way to help these people is to go and talk to them, not treat them, not treat them like dogs on the street, like yeah. simple as that. You know, so it's and it's easy as well because I've talked about it before about going and doing something like that, but like you said, COVID and stuff. And um, I was like, I'll film it so we can put it out there so people can see. Yeah. And then like, I had a couple of people say, oh, yeah, but you're just doing that to build yourself. And I'm like, well, yes and no, because you kind of want to get people to see it because hopefully you inspire people to go and do it. Like, I'm not doing it to yeah, like... Yeah, of course, yeah. The more people that see it, yeah, you're going to have half the people say, oh, he's just doing that to build himself. Well, yeah. Yeah, so you can get the message out there more, innit? Because if people aren't seeing it, you don't know. Like you said, you didn't know until you went down there, did you? Yeah, of course, yeah. And you will always get that, no matter what, whether it's you try and help someone, whether it be through charity. If you go down there and you do, you're like, you you want to know about about it, and, and it's to start off, like I said, to say, I admitted it. For, to start with, it was for me. I wanted, I wanted to see what it was like. Not how, how you know, and it changes your mind then because you you start actually after having conversations with people at home and stuff like that, and they see they see the struggles. You realize how lucky, yeah, you, you know you are. And if you want to go down there for yourself, then fucking do it. You're still going down there. You're still making effort. You're still getting out of bed. You're still getting out. You're sorry off the sofa and making an effort to go and help someone. Like whether you want to put that on Facebook after, it's completely up to you. At least you're getting it out there. I see some people share, share a meme saying, "Oh." Going up the charity, but just don't put it on Facebook because you're not. It's bullshit. You, well, you, actually, less people know about the charity. If of course you, they do. Like, course I'm, they can do. Course do you know what I mean? Do. Like, if you're promoting it, yeah, you're helping them. You're giving them free advertising. You maybe inspire. You might be like a thousand people on your Facebook see that you've been down and helped, and ten of them might go and help. Yeah, definitely. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. you can't look. Everyone looks at everything from such a negative standpoint, don't they? Instead of looking at it for what it is, they well, they always will. Unfortunately, yeah. and that that's a lot of things that I uh, at one stage when. I had enough of the boxing, like, because I was getting stick as well from it. And I was thinking, fucking hell, like, these people are giving me abuse. And um, they they haven't got off their fucking sofa. Do you know what I mean? They're literally, and they make Mark Thomas, who plays at Worcester now, and he, he's got a famous saying, dig, they're just fucking plant pots in the corner. <laughs> and he, he's right, like, they just be, but those plant pots are the people that judge you in life. Do you know what I mean? If you're willing to go out there and put your, put your, your you know, your body on your line or, or your, your name or anything like that, they are fair fucking play to you, like, do you know what I mean? But these people that sit, I can't stand these people that sit at home and and 90% of the time, they're the people that judge you, do you yeah. know what I mean? Because you're not them and and, and it, why should you be like them, do you know what I mean? It's, it's from the standpoint of, like, maybe they're looking at you and they're going, oh, I fancy doing something like that, but I didn't have the bollocks to. Of course, and, yeah. And they're looking at you like, you shouldn't be doing it, like, do you know what I mean? If I'm not doing it, you shouldn't be doing it. And and, you got to, like, try and drown it out of you. And, of course, yeah. And you're probably right there. You hit the nail on there there when you said it shouldn't be me doing it because probably a lot of people are thinking, 
it fucking should have been me that done all these boxing promotions. It should have been me that made the headlines. It should have been because of all the stuff that happened in the past. Do you, do you know what I like though is the fact that, like, yeah, you, you've openly admitted like you pissed people off and stuff. Yeah, and, yeah. Well, like you got haters become, and it's all. Become a fucking hobby. It's so easy <laughs> now. Do you know what I mean? Especially but, farmers. We won't start on them. But <laughs> I think like people need to like kind of respect where you've come from and hearing this. Hopefully they will to where you are now. It's yeah. like a massive gap, isn't it? Oh, huge. So, huge. but that's through. Exactly what it says there on the fucking tin. Experience. And um, it took a lot of ups and downs to... Uh, you know, I'm not saying I'm fucking in, in the best place. I'm in a very good place at the moment. Do you know what I mean? I've got my daughter in my life. My mum's, you know, showing good signs of, of you know, her cancer and stuff like that. I've got an amazing woman behind me, my family behind me, work's going well. You know, I, I am in a, a good place at the moment. Like, But I'll cherish this because I know, like... The person being being at the top and being successful and everything doesn't te- make you who, who you are as a person. Like, you, no, I, I think I you've totally got agree. you've got to be at the fucking bottom and have that real test and that grit to to work out who you are as a person. Like, and and I think that that for me, like having such up and down over through my teenage years, and, and the massive down was prison, and then like everyone always, it's a lot of people they. I've been called drug dealer and all sorts because my business is doing well and stuff like that. Well, hang on a minute. It's a Sunday morning and I'm out cleaning someone's fucking poo pipe out. Do you know what I mean? What are you doing? <laughs> you, you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, yeah. I've worked hard for where I've got through and the lads that work for me are absolutely brilliant. We're all a bit of... We're all... If you knew us all, which some of the local people do, you'd never put us all together as a, as a, as a, as a company, as a, as a workforce because we're all quite very similar. We've all had a quite a hard life, but we were all mucking together as a family uh, unit. And I was lucky enough to obviously work for PJ Martin, work for a good bloke, Gary Bowen, obviously, you know, Western Power and yeah. stuff like that. Um, you know, Gary's had a, had a fucking hard time and hard press of everything that happened to him last year. But I take my hat off that bloke. Um, I worked for him for four years. He um, he made me feel very welcome when I moved around to, Bre- to Brecon area. Because obviously you get someone from Landord who's who's ba- played rugby for Belf and, and and been like sort of a <laughs> first team manager at Belf to move to Brecon, and then all of a sudden there's that big thing between Brecon and Belf, is a fucking massive thing, and and um, they made me feel welcome, you know. And that's how I met Andy through Gary Barrett, through through Gary Bowen. It is I met him in a pub one day. And I saw I remember seeing Andy Powell and he's like, "Who are you?" I was like, oh, "I work for Bowen." Yeah. Oh fucking come here, boy! Put that around <laughs> here and there's a pint, and and you know what I mean. And that's the the um the warmth that I got off through working with him and being accepted into into a new area for me. And then obviously had the good years at Crick and all that. And um, looking at business wise, a business perspective, like uh, I speak to Gary quite a bit as well. Uh, funny enough, I was with him this morning. Um, he's he's done an amazing job. He's had a hard hard couple of couple of years with stuff that's gone on in his personal life and stuff like that. But he's still fucking there every day. Yeah. Still there with the same motto, living the fucking dream. And no matter, I take my after him, and I ad- I adore him, and I, I you know look up to him so much because he's he's dealt with a lot of shit, um, and he he's still there thriving out yeah. there. And I w- I walked down that yard today and seen that, and I thought fucking hell, mate. I've been there for a long time, see, because obviously moved back up, and obviously we're locked down, and managed to get down to see him. But it's such a change, yeah, and it's such a growth, and it's all stems through his hard work and the the, the lads that he's got working for him. You know, they all hard working men, and that I have had bosses over the years where you fucking despise them and you hate them uh, because they're horrible to you and stuff like that. Whereas he was, he made you feel part of everything, and he he showed an interest. He'd always say to you, "Stop you, you like me, everything's right, everything right at home, stuff like that." And, and that's the sort of bloke he is. And he always he always says, "I'm only as good as the fucking my men working for me." And a lot of bosses don't do that. A lot of bosses. Are stuck in their big houses where they're, all their workers are struggling to pay their fucking bills, yeah. and I don't ever want to be that that boss. Like, do you know what I mean? And uh, I get that through through him. Like, and it's he's taught me good things as well as, well as PJ Martin. Those two blokes I look up to, like on a business pers- perspective, they're two massive successful blokes in groundworks and and what they're doing. And you'd be stupid not to take it on board what they're doing because it's worked. It's worked, yeah. isn't it? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like you got to take it on board and use the formula really in it and try and make have, yourself yeah. a success, but. Seems to be going well, mate. So hopefully, yeah, keep we'll it see. going, and <laughs> hopefully, yeah, this year you can help out the homeless and hopefully get a show on. Yeah, no, to be honest, mate, it's been an absolute privilege. Down here. Like I said, um, I I probably wasn't going to call anyone out for a fight this year, even though I did call Nick out um, New Year's Eve on Facebook, which is probably the stupid thing for me to do because I was pissed up in a, <laughs> in a in a hotel on a business meeting. Um, with a contract that hopefully I've successfully won now um, in the summer coming up with Red Row, cool. looking at so. Um, 
like I said, uh, I just wish everyone the best. And uh, I, it's nice to come down here and have a chat. And hopefully some of you people can, you know, after watching this, you can probably see that, you know, the method beyond the madness really why I am, I'm outspoken. I'll speak the truth, and uh, you know, hopefully, you, you respect me for that. And and um, like like Mark Thomas said, don't be a fucking plant pot in the corner. Do you know what I mean? So, so and, and judging. So I think people, you know, if they take the time to watch it, they'll re- see who you are, see who you've come from, see why you are who you are, where you've come from, what you're doing now, and push on for more f- positive things. Happy and, days. Uh, thanks for coming on, mate. No problem. Cheers, Appreciate mate. it. Thank you, buddy. Cheers, Ta-da. Ta-da. Experience Real Podcast.